Welcome to the Golden Age of Cardboard podcast, where we remember a time when stacks of cards were held together with rubber bands and Mickey Mantles were put in bike spokes. We hope you will enjoy and reminisce as you come along with us as we tell stories about the baseball cards from the Golden Age of Baseball. We will examine the state of the vintage baseball card market and talk to some of the greatest collectors in the hobby. You won't be hearing us talk about any chrome or shiny cards here. Now, to take you on this retrospective journey, here's your host, direct from the shallow end of the gene pool, my son, Mike Moynihan. Yo and hello everybody, Mike Moynihan here, and welcome to another episode of the Golden Age of Cardboard Podcast. Today is episode 12, and I'm going to do something today that, you know, I just think about every once in a while and wanted to give some tips and tricks and just thoughts to people that are collecting vintage cards. But first, I want to mention the 2021 Baseball Hall of Fame ballot just was released. And this is always a great time of year. It's always fun over the next few months as the Hall of Fame balloting gets going. I'm always curious to see who's going to get in. Uh, You got the, you know, regular balloting where the writers vote, and then you have the balloting done by the different committees. You know, I always love adding greats of the game to the Hall of Fame. It's just one of those things that is every year kind of a really fun time. So looking forward to that. So check out the 2021 Hall of Fame ballot. I'm probably going to do one or maybe even two shows talking about the Hall of Fame because it's just one of those topics that I love to discuss. And there can be a lot of controversy with that. There can be a lot of you know, people who are on both sides, you got the PEDs issue, you've got, you know, players who are just greats of all time, but there's question marks like Barry Bonds, Roger Clemens, etc. So it's always fun to discuss it. And no matter where you fall on that argument, it, it's just a very, very interesting, fascinating topic. So today will probably be one of my shorter episodes, I would guess, because I'm first of all, I'm doing it solo, I'm doing it all by myself. So you only get to hear my voice today. If that's good, great. If it's not, well, hope you enjoy it anyway. But there's a lot of things that I'm going to cover when I'm going over these tips and tricks. And a lot of them will probably be things you already know things that are just kind of bricks to the forehead. But I'm hoping that through this conversation, through you hearing what I'm saying, that hopefully it'll reinforce maybe what you're already doing. But I know there are so many people re-entering the hobby. I mean, I hear it all the time. I hear it at shows. I hear it at, um, hear it online, people interacting with me on YouTube. So many people are coming back into the hobby and man, vintage is an area that if you're just not careful, you're, you can have a chance to get burned and, uh, really want to avoid that (laughs) as much as we can. I think we all do, you know, that's just not something that sounds fun at all. You know, speaking of shows, I've had the opportunity, those of you that watch me on YouTube, have probably seen these videos, but I had the opportunity this last weekend to go to a card show and we have them now here in the Dallas area pretty often now, like almost quarterly. And there's nothing like going to a card show. Card shops are great. Buying online is fine, but there's something about going to a card show where there's just hundreds or even thousands of people all out there kind of on that mission, that hunt for whatever it is that they are looking for. And I say it on my videos about card shows is people ask me all the time, what are you going to look for? And my answer is whatever I can find. I mean, the idea of 
having some targeted cards that you're looking for isn't bad, but I've always had the perspective that, man, I want to go ready to buy whatever is put in front of me that, that makes sense that I, that I would love to add to my collection. Because if you go with these expectations and what card you're really hoping to find, you have a chance of coming away disappointed. And so I just leave myself open to anything that kind of comes my way. So yeah, the show was a lot of fun. Got to go with several friends and hang out and see a bunch of people and get some really great deals. So if you haven't checked out those videos on my YouTube channel, I would, I would love you to do that. Uh, just so you can see what I got. I'm going to be talking, I'm going to be using one of the cards that I got at the show today as an example card of, of just kind of a lot of these things that I'm talking about. So when I'm talking to people about collecting vintage, there are just kind of many forms that that can really take. I mean, you've got people that collect sets and that's awesome. Putting together a vintage set. Maybe you're collecting a player, doing a run of their cards. Maybe you're just kind of picking up key cards throughout the years. Nothing wrong with that either. Maybe you want to have one mantle or one Aaron or a rookie, you know, you're doing rookie cards or you're doing some kind of thing. But my first tip goes to that is it's really important to have focus. Focus is just important to keep you on track. You you don't get distracted. You don't, you don't buy things that you end up going, man, why the heck did I buy that? Where does that fit in what, with what I'm trying to do? And we collectors, we have this weird mindset. We have this weird part of our brain that everything needs to have a place. I think whether it's how we store our cards, whether it's what we're collecting and why we collect it, but everything has a place. And if you, don't stay focused on vintage and you can go down a rap, you know, any given rabbit hole and end up like ah, just having regret. And it's not that you can't resell those cards. There's nothing, you know, you might go down a, a project and end up going, man, this is too hard or too expensive or whatever. Well, you can always get rid of those, but that's time wasted. That's, you know, things you could have been spending that money on that you didn't get a chance to. So staying focused, I think is kind of one of those keys. And for me, I'm focused on a lot of things. That's kind of the, both the goods and the bads of the way I collect is that I have so many projects and so many things I'm working on that I never run out of things to look for. And at the same time, I can, you know, also get distracted by just the sheer volume of stuff that I want to pick up. And so what I'll do is I'll focus on at different times on different areas of my collection. Maybe I'm working on a certain decade or a certain year or a certain player. And that kind of hones me in and narrows my focus to something that's actually achievable. So stay focused. Another thing to remember is when you're collecting vintage, typically you're a collector. Most people that that are in the vintage game are not the investor flipper type guys, the sneaker heads. They stay in the modern stuff, the basketball stuff, the guys that actually have their playing performances affect the value of their cards literally on a day-to-day -day basis. There's not much of that in vintage. It doesn't mean that vintage doesn't have the opportunity to appreciate and value. It certainly does and has, especially in the year 2020. But to me, the, Vintage world is the slow burn. Some friends and I like to say that collecting vintage is a marathon and it's not a sprint. So you have to have that long game in mind. You have to have, what am I, you know, where am I going with this? How long might it take me based on my budget? And that's not a bad thing to, to enjoy the longevity of this hobby is to have projects that keep your juices flowing you know, over the years. And so keeping in mind that it's not a sprint, that it's a marathon is, you know, just a good attitude to have as you're buying vintage. Another one of the things that I think is 
incredibly important and you hear this all the time and I really want to just dive into it because a lot of guys will say this and then leave it at that. I want to put some explanation behind it and it's by the card, not the grade. Again, most of you have probably heard that saying, but what it means is, for example, this weekend, this past weekend at the show, I was able to pick up a 1949 Bowman Roy Campanella rookie, and I bought it in a PSA four. And I was so, I've been eyeballing that card and thinking about that card for a really long time. And of course, with vintage, at least for me, I go, man, I could have bought that two years ago for a third of the price that I had to pay this weekend. And that's likely true on every card that I might buy in the near future. But even still, I saw one at the show and the guy wanted um, a price that I was not willing to pay. And so negotiations back and forth, some help from my friends ended up picking up the card in a four and I took it or I had it with me. I was walking around and I saw another dealer that had a PSA six, which is a full two grades higher. And that's a big deal in vintage, but it's, uh, you know, one of those things where it was about almost twice as much as my four that I paid for. And we pulled out the cards and we're comparing them. And the dealer looked at my four and went, man, that looks better than my six. Because what drew me to the four was just its beautiful eye appeal. Again, for a four, it had really good centering for the grade. And it just was very clean, no creases. The back was very nice. And so all in all, I was like, man, this is an incredibly solid card. And when you put it side by side with the six, it was in very little difference Again, in a lot of areas, the four was even better. The registration, the color, et cetera. And so by the card, not the grade, means that every grade tick that you go up, especially on the vintage, you're going to increase your price, sometimes exponentially. And the fact that all of us have hobby budgets, every dollar you spend on a card just to get some numerical grade some grade higher than what you're looking at in front of you is money you can't spend on another card. So, and there's nothing wrong with buying low to mid grade vintage at all. In fact, I think that's where the future of vintage is quite frankly, the top end of the market is so saturated with big, big money that quite frankly, for the average collector, they're, that's out of their price range today. Forget about what it might do in the future. And so the idea of getting eights and nines on these vintage, you know, great cards is not really feasible. And so I think that market is going to eventually kind of trickle down into the mid to low grade area of the market. I mean, who doesn't want, uh, you know, these great cards, Hank Aaron rookies and, you know, 56 tops, Hall of Famers, and whoever, you know, it's it's getting more and more desirable. People are wanting them more and more, and therefore, because the demand's going to be there, those, those low-graded cards, mid-grade cards, are going to start changing hands a lot more, and you're going to see prices appreciate because of that. So as I'm doing this negotiation for that Campanella, hold on, i got to grab my dog. Hang on. Sorry, Norman wanted to come up here. He wanted to join the podcast, so here he is. Um, As I was negotiating for that Roy Campanella, I was really kind of going, man, is that, first of all, do you even know if it's a good price when you're looking at it? I I didn't know the comps, and that's the tip, is to to know the comps of the cards you're going to buy, or at least know where to find them quickly. And... So I was looking at this Campanella again. It wasn't even on my radar. I saw, I mean, other than, I mean, I wasn't targeting it specifically at this show. Known I wanted one and saw it like, okay, is this a good price? So what I did was I went and checked on eBay 
you can pull up on your phone, eBay's completed items, sold items. I try to be very specific. I don't want to look at all of the PSA graded Campanellas. I want to look at the grade that I'm looking at to get an idea of what they've sold for. And I kind of look at the last two or three and just make sure that I'm not just overpaying by a lot. I don't mind paying up a little bit if it's a nice grade. And the fact that I get to walk away from it or walk away with the card matters. You know, there's some value to that, how much you can decide. But there's definitely some value to being able to see the card in person, not buying it based on some crappy scan on eBay or something like that. And so I realized, man, I'm not, this isn't too far off if I can get it for this price. Because the price he wanted was like $120, $130 more than I was willing to pay, than, than it, the last comps were, I should say. I ended up paying more and comps, but I was very conscious of that. At least I knew what I was doing in terms of, I had the information. And then I added in that value of being able to walk away with the card and that, that mattered to me. And so I was, you know, happy to get it. So it's knowing the comps and the other great place you can have comps is on VCP. Vintage Card Prices. It's a subscription service you can pay for. I happen to not have it, but I do have some buddies that do. So if I really needed a VCP price on a card, I could, you know, call in some favors and uh, my friends would look it up for me. I don't think it's that expensive. Maybe a hundred dollars a year, or something like that. I just go to Vintage Vintage Card Prices and uh, check that out if that's something you're interested. What's great about vintage card prices is it has historical price data, not just, you know, eBay kind of cuts off after the last 45 days. So if you have vintage card prices, you can go back years and it'll kind of show you the trajectory of that card, up or down or even. And that'll give you an idea. Man, I better, this card's hot, for example, whatever card you're looking at. This card's really selling a lot and it's gone up a lot in price over the last six months. I better buy it today because if it keeps going the way it's going, it's really going to get out of my price range. And that's kind of another tip. A little side tip is when's the best time to buy a card that you love and that you want in your collection? Well, when you see it, that's the best time. Assuming you can afford it and it's in your budget, then and buy it now because Another little anecdote, today's high prices are tomorrow's discounts. And so I just say that to, I can give you a story. Let me tell you a story about that real quick because I'll give you an example. Now, this was way back in 2014, so it's been a while, I grant you. But I had an opportunity to, I was at the National in Cleveland in 2014, and I had an opportunity to buy a 1953 Bowman Um uh, Oh gosh, Mickey Mantle. That's who it is. Mickey Mantle. I want to say it was a three or four. It was again, kind of low to mid grade, but it was $150. And for whatever reason, I, I wish I could tell you and go back to that, you know, Mike of se six years ago and, you know, shake him and go buy this card. You need to buy this. Uh, I didn't buy it. And it, I had the money. And I just, oh, I think at the time I wasn't really working on that set. And even though I thought it was a really cool card, I just passed on it. Now that card is, you know, well over a thousand dollars and I'm just kicking myself. And even, I know it's been crazy, but even a couple of years ago, it had gotten, you know, it had gone up three or four times. It's the, the $150 that I was looking at. And so I, I use that as motivation to me when I'm thinking, do I want to buy this now? This was certainly playing through my mind as I was deciding whether or not to buy the Campanella card. Man, if I don't get this now, what's it going to look like in six months, a year, two years from now, three years from now? Who knows? And I didn't want to miss that opportunity. Even though I did have to make a run to the ATM to make it happen. But I was through. I'm thrilled to death that I made that decision to buy the campy. And so knowing your comps, buy the card, not the grade. It's a marathon, not a sprint. All these things 
are just things. Again, most of you probably already know, but it's just things you need to be consciously thinking about as you're shopping at shows or shops or wherever. You know, it was funny how many times, speaking of knowing the comps, as we walked around the show, I would ask a dealer, so many dealers did not have cards that were priced, which is kind of one of my pet peeves. It's it's really annoying. I'd like to go to a to somebody's showcase, look around and say, okay, you know, that's way out of my range or, you know, way overpriced or wow, that looks like a really good deal. And then do my research. I don't want to have to wait for him to finish with somebody else if he's talking to somebody else and then go, okay, hey, what do you got on this card? And then pray and hope and that it's not just crazy and I've wasted a couple of minutes. I, I know that seems maybe a little bit silly as you hear probably Norman barking in the background. I apologize. But you want to, I want to just be able to look real quick and make a snap decision to move on because this ta this show, for example, is 400 tables. There's a lot to go through. And if stuff isn't priced, yeah, it's like, ah, so, you know, knowing the comps, Hey, what's this card price? The dealer would immediately pull out their phone and start looking at, you know, Hey, let's, uh, let's look at eBay comps and see what this card sold for. They're literally using the same ideas that we are in terms of, um, hold on, golly, every time phone rings, dog barks. You'd think a guy could just record a podcast without too many interruptions, but not the case. So they're pulling out their phones, looking at comps just like I would. And they're using, I mean, they've gotten a lot more savvy. It used to be back in the day, you know, what is eBay book value? Which of course had no real, <laughs> it didn't really matter in the, in the real world. What were they really selling for? Not what did eBay think they were selling for? But these guys have gotten a lot more savvy. They're they're using eBay comps, which is fair. I mean, that's what cards are selling for. If you wanted to know what the market is, that's a pretty good place to start for any card that's out there. So then another little tip and trick is to think about where you're buying your cards. Again, traditionally, we think about eBay for sure online. You've got auction houses, which is something I think people so underutilize. There are so many great auction houses out there. I mean, you're talking about God, dozen to 15 different auction houses. I mean, I've, I'm just looking at a list of auction houses that I have saved on my, you know, favorites, Golden Auctions, Hunt Auctions, Huggins and Scott, Sterling Sports Auctions, Leland's, Love of the Game Auctions, Robert Edward Auctions, Memory Lane, Heritage, Mile High Card Company, Clean Sweep Auctions. That's just maybe a third of what's really out there. There are so many places. And what's great about that, what's good about that, if you're a vintage card collector, is that spreads it all out. That spreads out the bidding. It spreads out the money. And so I have found some of my best deals at auction houses and people say, well, what about, you know, this and that, and the juice and you know, buyer's premium, all this stuff. And I just say, you know, take that into consideration when you're deciding what to bid. If it's a 20% buyer's premium and you bid a hundred dollars, then you know, you're really going to spend $120 plus shipping and maybe some tax. Just keep that in mind. You know, is that a comp? Is that a fair comp for that card? But I, I think it's like collectors are scared of auction houses for what any number of reasons. Um, they don't, and you don't really need to be. They're, they're a great source of vintage cards, certainly vintage autographs, oddball kind of stuff that you wouldn't see anywhere else. That, that's the place you want to look for that. But you know, you got eBay, you got shows, you got these auction houses, you've got shops. And so all of these places are great um, venues, mediums, so to speak, to pick up vintage cards. So try to utilize all of them. You know, if you're looking for a certain card, then 
don't leave any stone unturned, you know, go out and look and hunt and be patient. That is my next thing, which <laughs> is interesting because it kind of sounds counter to what I was saying earlier in regards to, you know, when's the best time to buy a card when you see it, it's, it's when you see it. And, and yet I'm also saying to be patient. It's highly unlikely on any of these vintage cards. In fact, not just highly unlikely, it's impossible that it's the only one you're ever going to see. And so, especially like when you're at shows uh, and there's tons of dealers or you're online, make sure you look at everything. One of my first rules of show a show is I try to walk the whole floor before I buy something, because I'm telling you the minute I buy something, I'm going to walk, you know, eight tables down and find the same card for significantly lower price. And so that's why I make sure, okay, oh, I saw that card. That's really cool. Uh, you know, let's say it's a 49 Bowman Campanella. I mean, that's really cool. Note the price, note where the dealer is, walk around, look at the rest of the show because you never know what you're going to find. And if it turns out that, hey, that that was the best deal on the floor, then go back, you know, make an, if you've made a note of where that dealer was and head back that way and, and buy the card. But don't leave any stone unturned. Make sure you're being patient at a show, being patient on eBay, because there will be another one. And I'm not saying wait forever because you're going to pay a lot more, but I'm just saying don't... Um, don't be in this giant hurry. Be patient. Okay. Um, and the last tip and trick is talking about graded versus raw and vintage. And man, I could do an entire episode on this topic. And perhaps I will someday. But the idea of buying graded, I mean, look, there's no secret that I'm a graded guy. I'm a huge um, graded guy. I love PSA stuff and that, but that wasn't always the case. That's something that has changed over about the last decade. And when I started getting into vintage, the thing I was most worried about was getting hosed, buying a reprint, buying a fake. And no one ever wants that to happen to them. And so how do you know, especially if you're learning, especially if you're new to, to the hobby or reentering the hobby after a long hiatus, how do you know? Fakes can be pretty good. And let's not kid ourselves. I'm not sitting here trying to say that PSA is perfect. Far from it. But if PSA looks at a card and I look at a card, or at least if PSA has rendered an opinion on its authenticity, then that's better than just me rendering an opinion on its authenticity. And so I think it's not about the numeric grade as much, although again, you want to buy the nicest card by the card, not the grade, but it's about, is this a real, you know, 1968 tops Willie Mays? Is it real? Because it's dangerous to buy cards that aren't. Now that doesn't mean they're going to detect if it's been trimmed or altered, or we, we know that whole story about, trimming and you know restored cards and all that kind of fun stuff i'm not trying to get into a debate about that i'm simply saying that at least with graded you know it's a real card and or at least you're more confident i would be more confident that it's a real card and for me again it's a collector it provides a consistency to my collection the anal retentiveness that i am the ocd that i have as a collector keeping everything kind of the same is super important and so i think buying graded is the way to go especially and maybe not if you're a set builder i guess i should say if you're a if you're just buying a bunch of commons of some vintage set that you're putting together and you want to buy a lot you know of 50 cards and they're all raw great but on the on the more valuable cards the superstars the hall of famers if you want to do a raw set, great. Buy a card that you like in a grade that you're, 
you know, happy with and then crack it out. If you want to keep your set in a binder and want to keep it raw, man, there's nothing wrong with that one bit. But I would tell you just buy the cards graded, buy them. And then it doesn't matter really what the card company is, if it's BGS or I guess BVG or SGC or PSA, who cares? Because you're going to crack it out anyway. But at least, you know, somebody else, a third party grader has rendered an opinion on the authenticity of the card. And to me, that's super important. So am I an advocate for buying one or the other? No, buy what suits your collection. But I'm telling you to, or I'm suggesting, recommending that you consider looking at graded cards for the Mantles and the Mays and the Aarons and the Kofaxes and all these bigger cards that are a lot pricier and the cost of being wrong is significantly higher. And then crack them out. Put them in your set. Put them in your collection. Even if it's a player set or whatever. There's nothing wrong with that. At least then you know what it was and that it was as legit as we can probably get. So, man, that's it. Uh, I bet there's a whole bunch of stuff I'm forgetting, tips and tricks, but I just wanted to at least spend a little bit of time this week. I didn't have time to come up with a a guest for this week. I am going to have someone on for next week, which is going to be Thanksgiving week. But maybe you'll have some extra time to listen to somebody else since this episode's probably only going to be about a half hour long. So, you know, that's it for today. I really appreciate you listening. I love how many people are enjoying the podcasts and just enjoying the camaraderie of the hobby. Let me know, you know, especially on YouTube, any comments of topics you'd like to see me cover in future episodes. Uh, It's going to be interesting to see what happens over the holidays, how much I'm going to be able to stay on track with my schedule. Got a lot going on, but I'm going to try to keep doing weekly episodes and would love to hear from you on what you'd like to hear me talk about. And I'll try to get subject matter experts in each of the areas that we want to discuss. So Today wasn't, there was no other subject matter expert other than me telling you some tips and tricks about vintage card collecting. And I hope you learned something and thanks for listening. So everybody out there have a great week and keep collecting.